today I'm standing in front of you in all humility, wanting to share with you some of the wonderful things uh, that I've experienced, some life-changing experiences I've had in my life. As, uh, as I was introduced, I'm not a full-time artist, neither am I a trained artist uh, or not even a veteran social worker. I'm a boarding techie uh, and uh, I've been working in the corporate world for the last uh, 10 years, trying to make organizations more profitable. But uh, deep inside, I'm a full-time artist, at heart, at least. And today, I would like to talk to you about uh, some of these life-changing experiences I've had working with some really wonderful people and the nonprofit organizations that they represent. The present day can be best uh, described as the age of excess. So the perception is that more is less. Conventional probably then mean, uh, could probably be synonymous to things like luxury or extravagance. To be an artist today, uh, an artist uh, needs to be very vocal, almost to the point of exaggeration in order to be heard or accepted in this fraternity today. So discretion, which used to be considered a virtue back in the day, is uh, probably considered a lack of identity today. So the way the word conventional has evolved over time, Artists like myself, who actually believes in keeping to myself, is constantly required to challenge the new conventional. Then again, if you look at the, uh, the art fraternity, how it's grown over the years in the modern world, uh, the sheer populace of it or the colossal diversity that we see uh, in any form of art in, around the world, uh, it would be rather presumptuous of me or anyone to think that this evolution has happened in a conventional way. Art is a confluence of different uh, you know, cultures and traditions and ideologies and religions. And we all think that we are challenging the conventional in one way or the other. Whether we are trying to say the same thing or whether we are trying to say different things, we all agree that the one thing that could help anyone be heard in this elephantine world of art is the novelty or the originality that he or she brings with this sort of work to this world that already has a plenty of everything. So it's easy to trail behind the tried and tested, uh, the consideration being that sustenance is uh, important, you know, survival is important. It's, uh, it's no wonder that we don't see the Michelangelo's and Mozart's being produced in today's world. It's, uh, if you ask me honestly, I would say it's quite difficult for someone to pursue art just for art's sake. Today, as I told you, I want to touch upon a few stories, few uh, important people uh, that have touched my life, that have changed my life in many ways than one. And uh, I would like to share these instances with you. So I was born in uh, this small town in Cochin, uh, called Cochin, um, back in Kerala, a uh, land of uh, coconut trees and toddy shops and tourists and a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, I, I went to the school, uh, the neighborhood school, it was an Anglo-Indian boys high school. So now this is the interesting part. Uh, my mom was there. Uh, she was a math physics teacher and also the principal of the school. So it's, it's not uh, so much fun to have your mom around. I'm sure at least some of you would have had this experience, you know, at least one parent being in your school. So it was all good uh, while I was a kid, um, a mom to run to for anything and everything in school. But as you grew up, uh, you know, the expectations people have on you goes up and it's, and all the happening guys in school, you know, they'll be finishing their lunch fast and running to the neighboring girls high school, camping there, while I'll be sitting and doing my homework in the principal's cabin. It was not much fun. Then we reached the uh, eighth standard. That's our entry to the high school. And it was a very exciting year for all of us boys. It was a boys high school, so we had this, uh, in biology, we had this interesting chapter, chapter eight, uh, human reproduction, right? Uh, we, had, we had gone through that the moment we got the textbook. But uh, yeah, I'll tell you the story. So this uh, biology teacher, lady teacher apparently, uh, she started off uh, way down the bottom of the food chain. We talked about uh, single cellular orga organisms, uh, protozoa, bacteria, hydras, went up the food chain, and our fishes, amphibians, reptiles, finally reached mammals. And chapter 8 was almost there, and then I fall sick, right? Uh, I, I got the swelling in my foot, my ankle, 
I blamed it on a rough game of football, but the next day I got swelling on both my knees as well. I was uh, diagnosed with this with this thing called rheumatic fever. Uh, some of you might have heard about it. It's a condition where you get uh, swelling on your knees, your ankles, your basically all your joints, and uh, the biggest damage it could do is uh, to your heart. So in more than 50% of the cases, they say it scars the valves of your heart and uh, you know, eventually you know what happens. So my dad spared no expense, uh, took me to four different hospitals, uh, the same test over and over again and finally I ended up in a medical college in Chennai. So all of a sudden my attention moved from chapter 8 in biology to, to rheumatic heart disease. Okay, and in this medical college in Chennai, uh, I was given the verdict that I will live and that it's not affected my heart yet, but there's always a but, right? So the but was I will be poked every 21 days with this humongous vial of penicillin, they call it the Penadio, and with this crazy, with this crazy big syringe uh, needle, I used to refer to that as a horse needle, every 21 days, yes. And uh, before they discharged me, they wanted to start off that, that course. And uh, being the dude that I am, I wouldn't want to cry in front of a woman. And being a medical college, you, you would have uh, these medical students all around you, right? Uh, even if it's a small stitch or surgery, they would want to sit and, they would want to watch and learn. So the nurse comes with a needle and she pokes me and I didn't cry. It was a small needle. And I was so happy that uh, it's over. And I was getting ready to leave. And then she comes back with a small ballpoint pen. And then she marks uh, a circle around where she poked me in the hand. Apparently, that was just a test dose. Uh, penicillin is supposed to react. Uh, some batches of penicillin could react and could become fatal. So they do this test dose. And then they throw you in this waiting room for 20 minutes to think about the inevitable, you know, the horror for 20 minutes. So that's where I think I had my first lessons on compassion. Um, compassion, as all of you know, it's an inherent human quality. We all have it in us. But the conditions for compassion to be aroused, uh, it's different in different individuals. It could be a passing of a loved one. It could be your pet dog, you know, a death of a pet dog or, or sickness. So I was waiting in this room and I met this guy, uh, another kid, honestly I don't remember his name. He was busy having his lunch. So apparently he was brought in for the same reason. Uh, he just finished his test dose and uh, he was having his lunch. He was brought in by a, a, a social worker from a neighboring orphanage. And he was not as lucky as me, you know, the, the disease has already affected his heart. So that's when I started counting my blessings, right? I thanked the superior power for everything I had, a wonderful life to go back to, a mom that is standing by the door and crying for me, worried about me. And I thought, what did this guy had? You know, he, was, he had bigger problems in life. He was not worried about these silly things. And, uh, you know, that's one biggest learning I learned that day. Count your blessings when you're in pain, and all of a sudden you'll see that go that pain will go away. Minutes later, we both got poked, and we both uh, screamed our lungs out. But yeah, and I I pray to God, and I like to believe that the boy is still alive somewhere, and those injections saved his heart. Okay, I came back to Cochin after that, so there was a gap of two two months. Um, for my, my little field trip, I missed biology chapter number eight. So I come back to class, and uh, to my surprise, I was told a biology ma'am stepped down and brought in this Malayalam language teacher to teach that chapter for us. And he was considered the Hitler in the school. So no questions asked. Forty minutes, entire chapter is over. I felt really sad that. Uh, we were interfering with our academic freedom. You know, Bob, we are censoring our right to enlightenment and discussion of such an important scientific subject. Uh, 
even today, I know our children grow up in an increasingly perverse world, but still sex education is considered a controversial issue. It's a taboo. So later in my life, I did a whole charcoal series on taboo. I'll, I'll come to that a little later. So life was a business as usual. Uh, the only sad part was every 21 days, there was a red circle marked in my calendar. To avoid my mom uh, crying every time she accompanies me for this shot, I requested my uncle, who was a medical representative, to take me around for these injections every 21 days. And I used to uh, you know, dread that experience there, but after this test dose, I get this 20 minutes. So we used to go to a neighborhood a government hospital. And uh, this 20 minutes I get, I used to roam around the general wards. I'd made friends with the staff there. And, you know, again, uh, learned some important lessons in compassion. So compassion is uh, the capacity to see clearly into the nature of suffering. You know, the ability to stand strong, at the same time recognize that you're not separate from the compassion, from the suffering. And the best part is compassion gives you the ability or it basically inspires you to transform the suffering. So to a great extent, uh, what I learned those days helped me get involved with various causes while I could when I came to Bangalore. Charity begins at home. All of you might have heard this wonderful quote by Andrea Curran. It applies to, I think, almost all of us, right? Uh, we've got our basic values from our parents. My version of it is charity and art begins at home. So I've always uh, noticed my mom with this whatever mean government salary they get. And they're sponsoring a lot of kids, not just their school fees, their books, whatever. And towards the end of the month, I see there's a money crunch at home. And I never understood you know, the whole idea behind the art of giving. And she and some other wonderful teachers in school uh, who try to start this program, a free lunch program for these kids from underprivileged backgrounds. Uh, they were denied a grant from the government and uh, what they did is pull out the money from their own salaries and they started it and it still runs. So these things, uh, and of course uh, I was a part of uh, NCC, uh, the National Cadet Corps. So we used to visit these uh, charities, like Missionaries of Charities by Mother Teresa, every Saturday. And all these things, uh, you know, I understood that these are some life-changing experiences that you get when you get involved with these causes. I did my engineering, got campus placed uh, to Bangalore, my entry into Bangalore quite over with this wonderful city and also a lot of beautiful women in Bangalore. First time I'm seeing so many uh, wonderful people reach Bangalore and uh, yeah, I started pursuing my art. Uh, I start, started concentrating on charcoal as a medium, it was something very close to my heart. And eventually I started blogging about it and met a lot of like-minded individuals who uh, could relate to it. And I ended my first uh, contract on a solo exhibition in Bangalore. Uh, a very close friend of mine, uh, she was on Facebook and she uh, was uh, starting this campaign called the Pink Chronicles. It was uh, a breast awareness campaign. And she had uh, reached out to me to see uh, if I can help promote the cause in some way. So I told you about uh, my biology class and how sex was a taboo subject back then. So by then I had uh, worked on the series called Taboo and it was a series of 15 works, nothing vulgar, uh, aesthetic nudity of course. So I, I, I was thinking, you know, uh, people use a female body to sell things from cigarettes to sofas, you know, why can't I use some of these imageries to design a poster to help spread awareness on this cause. That was a part of the series, but uh, later when we add this cause angle to it, it actually helped us spread the awareness on this cause, on the internet, like wildfire, right? Like how we see Colibri D spread now, we were able to spread this awareness uh, in a faster way. Uh, then comes 2005, I got an opportunity to uh, do a portrait of Bill Gates and gift it to him in person. 
on a lighter note, I have mentioned my account number behind that. Someday you'll see it, and I'll get a call from my manager. Okay, the reason I uh, mentioned Bill Gates is uh, not because I work with Microsoft or my annual review is around the corner. I hope they're listening. Uh, the reason is that there's one interesting quote. Uh, I think Bill Gates uh, talked about it in one of those uh, pass out ceremonies in Harvard University. Um, until we are uh, educating every kid in a fantastic way, until we are uh, cleaning every inner city, uh, there is no shortage of things to do. So actually if you think about it, there is no shortage of uh, good things to do in this world. So um, uh, I was fortunate enough uh, that art gave me recognition. My art, I got uh, uh, openings and uh, invitations to various art fairs, art festivals, art auctions, solos and group shows. And uh, the best part here is, you know, uh, all these interesting and wealthy collectors and private collectors who are interested in your work, you know, when you interact with them, I got to know that they also have a soft side to them. You know, they are also concerned about these uh, important causes that exist around them. So I wanted to use uh, this network that I built to raise awareness and raise money for these causes that were very close to my heart. I started off in 2009 uh, working with this uh, NGO called Dream a Dream. It's uh, a wonderful little organization uh, started by Vishal Talreja, a very close friend. So they work with destitute kids, they provide life skill training for them. So the whole idea was to use my artwork um, to build a calendar, a desktop calendar, which we would then eventually customize for corporates and uh, sell it around and also, you know, raise awareness on the cost. So uh, that, that didn't work that well because each calendar was priced at 1,000 rupees and we were not able to uh, penetrate that much. But then eventually we learned, it became a group project, a lot of people got involved designers, uh, PR agencies. In 2010, I worked with this organization called Snehanalaya. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I won't be able to, uh, you know, do justice to these causes by talking about them in just one line uh, compared to the enormous work, wonderful work that they do. 2011, it was Asha Niketan. It's a home for mentally challenged people in Bangalore. I, I would like to take a moment to talk about the current project. It's 2012, it's for Vimochana. Vimochana is a Bangalore-based organization. It's, uh, it's 32 years, I think, uh, in Bangalore. It's been around for that long. Uh, they basically defend the, the human rights of women whenever and wherever it's violated, you know, a cause that was very close to my heart. And uh, you know, the, the whole idea is to uh, make violence against women unthinkable and also make an environment where violence is not thought about at all. So today I feel that uh, this journey that I've started, combining my art, my networking, and my charity, charitable causes, is going to be a lot more meaningful than I'd ever imagined. You know, in a way, the people that I've worked with in this journey have helped uh, reinforce the fact that uh, whatever I've set out to do actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, we all are familiar with what are the best and worst things human beings can do to one another, can do for one another. We have seen the extraordinary things human beings are capable of. It's a universal uh, desire that we all, all of us have in us, a desire to give back to the society. And if the sense of purpose is good, good enough, we are capable of doing really magnificent things. I would like to uh, talk to you about one, one important, one very small quote by Dostoevsky, who was a very uh, powerful artist and a free thinker. He once said, Beauty will save the world. It's, it's one of those lines that's been interpreted in so many different ways. But it's really important for, for us to understand uh, the actual meaning behind that, you know, the, the huge message that it carries. If we try to challenge everything, uh, challenge all the notions of that, challenge the notions of everything that is considered conventional, and try to live our life with the thought that we are actually uh, enhancing somebody else's life as well. At the same time, I'm encouraged to believe that beauty will indeed save the world. I would like to end with a wonderful quote by late Steve Jobs. The people who are crazy enough to think 
that they can change the world are the ones who actually do. There's, there's so much good that can, that can be done in today's world and a lot of life-changing experiences awaits all of us. Thank you.